Ready? Do it. Are you ready, Sam, for the clap? Aye, 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 Captain. <laughs> All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Hey, everybody, and welcome to Book Retorts. I'm Danielle. I'm Sam. And this is a podcast where one of us finds a weird piece of media and shares it with the other person who has no experience or knowledge of it. On our previous episode, Sam, you'll remember, and you'll prove that you remember shortly, <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, that we discussed Sweet Valley High's book, The Evil Twin by Francine Pascal. And this follow-up episode is actually the return of The Evil Twin, which is one of the... <laughs> She's back and eviler than ever. <laughs> exactly. That's the tagline for the book. How if did you not, know? it should be. <laughs> So we're going to start out. I actually don't have a book back for you to read this time because all of them gave away way too much information. And this book goes very quickly into the actual plot. So you're not going to be questioning what's happening for long. But I would love for you to give us a summary on what happened in the (laughs) previous. That's fair. For everyone who listened to our Sweet Valley High episode, I appreciate your sympathy. Sam was shocked, shocked and appalled that Sweet Valley High was just so much murder. Well, let's start with that then. That seems a good place to start because the first thing that happened... No, wait. Shoot. Before the murder, there was the drugging. So, Sweet Valley High is a fictional place in California. Yes? Yes. Right? Okay, You're on the right good. track. It was a good, good start. <laughs> I'm not sure about any of this. There are these two girls, the Wakefield twins, mm-hmm. Elizabeth and Jessica? Yeah, good job. That was pretty good for us. I'm uh, impressed. I'm not sure if it was Jessica or Jenny or something. <laughs> oh, all right. Halfway Elizabeth there. Elizabeth and Jessica. Elizabeth is the good twin. Jessica is the, I don't want to say bad twin, but like the, the goofus to her sister's gallant. Sure. Which is the only way that I can associate them with. <laughs> Apparently. This is how it works in my brain. So there was some prom incident where they were competing to be prom queen, but Elizabeth decided to withdraw. But before she made that known, Jessica spiked her punch, got her drunk, where she <laughs> took her boyfriend, Sam, not Elizabeth's boyfriend, but Jessica's boyfriend, Sam, for a ride. They crashed. Sam died, which was personally traumatizing to me <laughs> as a Sam. <laughs> I'm glad you remember that part, at least. And I think the worst part of the entire book. And later, we find out that she gets off scot-free because there was some other drunk guy out there who crashed into them. So she has no repercussions for her DUI at all. Yes. (laughs) It seems to be the case. And her guilt over Sam's death is somewhat short-lived. Although, Jessica... Yes, I'm still not sure. (laughs) Uh, Jessica still holds her responsible, even though she's the one who drugged her in the first place. Absolutely. Bad, Jessica. No biscuit. Then we find out there's Margot. I don't know her last name. Don't know if it matters. (laughs) Is it Margot Stabbington? Because that would be appropriate. (laughs) Yes, that was her name. Margot Stabbington and the Wakefield twins. (laughs) That would be a great (laughs) name. Band name. (laughs) No, that'd be a great name for like a Josie and the Pussycat style cartoon, like a Scooby-Doo, Margo <laughs> Stabbington and the Wakefield Twins here to solve mysteries. And also have a band. They would totally have a band, just like Josie. They would absolutely have a band. They all have a band. Even like, did Scooby and the gang ever have a band? Did who? Did Scooby and the gang ever have a band? Yeah, they're, they're, doesn't their van have like drums in it sometimes? They're, I just thought it was a van that was dirty, but what do I know? <laughs> that they had me oh i don't i don't know actually i might be making that up but i feel like maybe some rendition of them was in a band they must have been i feel like they're i really want to google this right now but <laughs> you can <laughs> i mean it's not like we haven't wasted 40 minutes of doing nothing else Shh, they don't know that <laughs> Listeners, maybe you can enlighten us on the yeah, there you go. musical stylings of Scooby and the Gang, the Mystery Incorporated band. We would love for you to answer questions we could Google. <laughs> yeah, please. We are lazy and tired. 
That's accurate. That's very accurate. All right. I'm sorry. I derailed us pretty far. Let's get back <laughs> on to it. Margot Stabbington, she is a foster child who is sociopathic. She murders her stepsister, not stepsister, foster sister, mm-hmm. by making her stick a knife in a, in a <laughs> toaster. Yeah. And then the house catches fire and everyone dies because she deaths it all in kerosene. And that's insane. <laughs> and then she goes on the lamb for Ohio. Where'd she start? I don't know. It doesn't I don't matter. Remember. I couldn't remember. That's why you don't know. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It clearly, it's not important. She ends up in Ohio where she somehow convinces the most negligent parents to give her a babysitting job. <laughs> Where she murders the younger brother <laughs> slash child of those people and the then goes on the lamb again. It's so crazy in the retelling. It's actually somehow crazier listening to you repeat it back. She also robbed them, but I feel like her main motivation was the murder. Absolutely. So she goes on the lamb from being on the lamb, so double <laughs> lamb, gets a bus, is heading towards California for some reason, because that's Her the biological best place to go. family. She thinks her biological family's there. Okay. Well, I forgot how she found that out. I think she just Doesn't knew matter. it. She just knew it? Okay. So she's on the run, on a bus to California. She's being followed by... Josh? That sounds right. <laughs> it's one of the, I know there's a Josh and a James, but I don't remember which one is which. No, I think James Josh, is, Josh is the brother. James is the Jessica's dirt new bike, boyfriend. Yes. Yeah. James is the dirt bike guy. I remember him now. Anyway, on a bus, head to California. She's being followed by Josh, the brother of the person she murdered in Ohio, who somehow did not involve the police. And she sees a newspaper with Elizabeth's mugshot or whatever in it, mm-hmm. detailing her upcoming court case about her DUI and thinks, that's someone I want to be right now. <laughs> I look she, just like her, she looks except like for the like fact her. that I am brunette and she is blonde and probably have different hairstyle and maybe different heights. Who knows? It's a photograph. I don't know how tall she is. doesn't say. <laughs> No, she's identical, Sam. All right. My mistake. So she immediately changes plans to head towards Sweet Valley, which is – I'm sorry. I can't stop thinking about salad dressing whenever I say that. (laughs) It's a weird correlation, but okay. Hidden Valley? Please, come on. Oh, yeah, of course. You're right. I'll give it to you. Give me a pass. Sweet Valley sounds like a sweet ranch dressing, which sounds disgusting. (laughs) Like, ew. (laughs) All right. Anyway, heads to California. Oh, I haven't even gotten to where this book basically starts. <laughs> I I'm don't gonna, know why I'm you're going go... in so much depth. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Because this is the part that's seared in my brain. This is the part I remember the best. Fast forward. She gets there. She starts following around Elizabeth, trying to take her place. She messes with her mom. She goes and pretends to be Elizabeth to talk to the mom to like test out being Elizabeth. She mm-hmm. wants to kill her and steal her identity. <laughs> She's just messing things up, doing shenanigans. If you care about what those shenanigans are, go listen to the episode because frankly, there are too many and they're too stupid to recount right now. <laughs> She gives Valentine's or no Christmas cards or something to them that say like, have a bloody Christmas, I'm going to stab you, yada, 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 (laughs) booga, booga. That's pretty much what she does because she just decides to mess with them like she's (laughs) Jigsaw from the Saw movies for some reason. I like the idea that she sent them a card that says, Merry Christmas, I'm going to stab you. (laughs) (laughs) That's basically what she says, right? Does she like have a bloody Christmas or whatever? Yeah, candy cane killings, I guess. Yeah, right. Okay. How is it any different? <laughs> How is it's not? Nick you're right. I'm going to stab not. you, and oh, I'm going to kill you with the candy cane. Any different? <laughs> That would have been a funny plot. She should have totally killed them with the candy cane. But she doesn't because through a series of machinations I won't get into and a bunch of sisterly drama I do not care about, <laughs> the parents go to San Francisco. There's a big storm. There's a New Year's Eve party. And that's where she decides she wants to kill Elizabeth at a party because that's smart and take her place at a party <laughs> with lots of witnesses. Margot Stabbington, not the criminal mastermind I first took her for, goes to this party. She confronts Elizabeth, who's like, oh, and they have a little scuffle in a pool house. And then somehow a piece of glass falls on her neck, killing her. And James was in there somewhere. She was (laughs) briefly Jessica's boyfriend, I think, who got pushed off a pier and died. But who cares? Oh, also Josh shows up. He was there, too. But again, who cares? (laughs) I'm super impressed. Like, good job. <laughs> I 
really front loaded that description <laughs> yeah. of the book. You like crushed through the last eighty percent of the book. <laughs> the last eighty percent of the book is pretty much just the same thing happening over and over, which oh, is basically is. Margot going up to Elizabeth and going, like, "Can I be Elizabeth now? Let me test it out." And then you know, Three's Company style hijinks and soon everyone mistakes her for Elizabeth, and then she's still not stabbing her. Yep. And you're gonna love this uh, upcoming book because oh, it's the same plot. <laughs> We'll just go ahead and ruin it, Danielle. <laughs> oh, it doesn't ruin anything, trust me. <laughs> so, as far as we know, Margot Stabbington is dead. Mm -hmm. James is dead. Josh still hasn't told the police that Margot killed his brother. Oh, well, the police showed up, so I'm sure. He did tell oh, them yeah. that, but there was no proof and nobody believed him. So he went on his own. As we established, I think the police sound awful in this book because <laughs> they don't really know how to handle a DUI and they don't know how to do an investigation or believe people when they say, hey, that babysitter who skipped town and robbed us also killed my brother. But like, nah, he probably just died from falling down the stairs onto a knife. <laughs> And drowned. I think he drowned. Whatever. He fell down <laughs> some stairs into a pool. Absolutely. Either way, it sounds dubious. Okay, so great summary. Good job. Is there anything I left out that we'll need to know before starting this next book? I don't think so, but I can always fill people in as we go along if I think of something. To be fair, halfway through your description, I got confused, so I don't know. <laughs> you got <laughs> <laughs> uh, what confused you? I mean, I don't think it wasn't confusing, but you should at least have the context to understand what I'm saying. There's just a lot of information and it's all very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> I did dump a lot of info there at the last minute, but I feel like some stuff you need to know. Do you really need to know about the locket or the diary reading? No. Or the movies? No. Or her trying to mack on what you didn't know. You didn't need to know that Margot really wanted to mack on Elizabeth's boyfriend. That's actually pivotal to the plot, so that's... That's a good, that's a good add-in. Yeah, she kept on trying to seduce him by being aggressively sexual, which he, as a good boy from the black and white sitcom era, was not having. <laughs> All right. Well, let's dive into Return of the Evil Twin. I really want this to be like a Star Wars sequel where suddenly there's a whole bunch of them showing up. You know, <laughs> well, it's like the whole luck. empire, all of the <laughs> evil twins are coming out of the woodwork. Okay, so... It opens up with a prologue. Oh, jeez. I thought I just did that. <laughs> it starts where we left off. So you did. You you summed up what was in the prologue. As you mentioned, Margot had been pushed through a glass window and she had been presumed dead. They checked on her. She seemed dead. She was put into I an ambulance. I predicted she was not dead in the last episode because <laughs> find this out. is comic book rules, I'm <laughs> guessing. Also, do we actually know her last name? Because calling her Margot Stabbington, I'm okay <laughs> with it. I just want to feel like we've done our due diligence. It's Margot Chappelle, I think. I was so close. Are you <laughs> I kidding Stabbington, me? Chappelle, exactly they have the same. S. Yeah. It's great. I give myself full marks. I completely understand where you got that a little <laughs> messed up. The twins, Jessica and Elizabeth, they meet up with her friends and family. They're on the lawn of the house where that party was, the New Year's party. And the party's over. And in the background... Yeah, murder tends to do that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, doesn't help. At least they got to New Year's before murder <laughs> happened, more or less. What a great way to kick off the New Year. <laughs> yeah. In the background, like unnoticed by the guest, the ambulance that had loaded Margot onto it stops abruptly, then races down the road, swerving wildly. All right, that's the prologue. Sets you up. You know, something's going on with the ambulance. Okay, so she somehow, after getting a shard her neck, managed to overpower EMTs and take control of an ambulance. Got it. Quite possibly. Or maybe they were possessed or something. I mean, who knows with this story plot? Oh, this turned supernatural. <laughs> oh, there were psychic powers. I forget about <laughs> It was a little supernatural in the last book. Uh, this book is killing me. <laughs> so chapter one begins. It's almost one year later, so it jumps ahead in time. Oh, that's right. They're all Christmas themed. Yeah, I know. I don't think they're all Christmas themed. Just these ones are. The twin murdering ones. Sure. I mean, there's 181 books. So yeah, some of them are probably Christmas themed. I'm just saying, would we consider this to be a Christmas story? Like Absolutely. Die Hard? Yes, because Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Don't at me. It's totally a Christmas movie. I'm not going to do this, Danielle. I'm going to stay out of this. I'm a neutral party. I just think it's a good movie. I don't care if it's a Christmas movie or not. I just think it's a good movie. I don't need to get into the minutia of what kind of movie it is. Just watch the movie and enjoy it. Who cares? It's a great movie, but I also watched it on the holidays. So the twins are on better footing. It's been a year. Jessica kind of has forgiven Elizabeth, as she should have probably. Has Elizabeth forgiven Jessica for drugging her? Yes. Elizabeth also has forgiven Jessica for... <laughs> <laughs> drugging her drink, basically. Jessica has seemed to not only stop blaming Elizabeth, but she's also recovered from the death of not just one, but two of her boyfriends. <laughs> she bounces back quick. <laughs> Faster than you know, because she has a new boyfriend. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jessica, where the power of lust overpowers grief. His name's Ken. He's a quarterback for the football team. Of course he is. <laughs> Elizabeth's still with Todd, who I remember from the last book was her long-term boyfriend that Jessica- I did not remember his name. <laughs> sort of tried to steal, and Margot definitely tried to steal. Both of the sisters definitely still need therapy, so that hasn't changed in the last year. Are the parents still negligent about their emotional as state? As far as I know, it doesn't say anything about them having therapy, though, after the death of so many people. Yeah, no kidding. And That's nine, a traumatizing event. 99 other books books very similar to that one, you think that they would have constant therapy. Okay. Give me a second here. You said 99 other books. How much murder is in these books? Because... I don't know. There's definitely one I read, I think it was Sweet Valley, where the cheerleading captain is kidnaps the cheerleaders and tries to murder them. So that's another one. <laughs> these... This is awful. These children are traumatized. They have PTSD up the wazoo. Oh, yeah. It's not just like murder and kidnapping. There's lots of crazy stuff that happens. <laughs> I don't think I would want to live in Sweet Valley. I know. I mean, it's like living in any city where there's constant murder. Like, who lives in Gotham? Why? Why? Why would you ever live yeah. in Gotham City? Or why would you ever live where Jessica Fletcher lives? Like, why? <laughs> well, to be fair to Jessica Fletcher, who is a hero, she often travels. Like, she's often contracted to go to other places. That's because they realized that the per capita murder rate was like... <laughs> One in 60. <laughs> I think, no, I think that she gets contacted by people to come to their places to do, you know, the investigation, at least in the early, in the early seasons. I don't Absolutely. know. I didn't watch all that much of Murder, She Wrote. That's a shame. Only so much time, Danielle. Well, maybe you should add that in. Okay, fine. <laughs> to your time. <laughs> make time, Sam. Make time. I should make time for Jessica Fletcher. Okay. Anyway... <laughs> Back to our intrepid heroes. New Year's is in three weeks, so it's just shy of a year since all the murder and mayhem happened. And they're discussing their upcoming New Year's plans. So there aren't any parties this year. Maybe everybody was, you know, a little scared to have one after the last fiasco. Prudent. And Elizabeth suggests that they use the time to plan the hospital fundraiser that they're helping with at school. And <laughs> Jessica is like, mm, no, it's New Year's Eve. I'm not like hanging out with a bunch of nerds and planning <laughs> the fundraiser. Jessica, already my favorite. <laughs> So Elizabeth suggests an alternative. She's uh, there at the breakfast table. She looks over the newspaper and she notices that there's a local carnival in town. And so she's like, hey, is it haunted? Yes, it's haunted. That's what the plot of this <laughs> is. And then Scooby-Doo shows up. It's a whole shebang. Well, the, he, they hired him to play the uh, New Year's gig. <laughs> that must be it. <laughs> So Elizabeth suggests this alternative. She sees in the newspaper about going to a local carnival. And Jessica's kind of on the fence about it. But her dad mentions that the, he knows the owners. He helped them get some permits for the carnival. He's a lawyer. He's a lawyer, may right? may remember. Yeah. And uh, that they were concerned that nobody would be showing up for New Year's Eve. And so it would be super supportive if they would go and actually go on New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Sure. Two people showing up is much less sad than nobody showing up. Well, Jessica has the brilliant idea to rent out the carnival for the night so Sell tickets to the school and split the proceeds with the carnival. So she's going to scam. No, she's using the rest for the fundraiser I was just talking about. And the carnival is local. Maybe they want to support the local community. I don't know. They haven't talked to the carnival oh, so yet. Oh, it's like a traveling carnival? I did. It seemed like it was some kind of... Uh, they, they Honestly, they mentioned it in the book, but I would like don't remember something about they were locals <laughs> they came back to town they set up a carnival there and I, I don't know if it's just like a local place that is holding a carnival or if it's like a big fair carnival it, it, there's a lot of different rides and stuff there fair enough because we will be there later obviously and so yeah, yeah. everybody's excited at this idea and the, the quote is this is going to be the most exciting new year's eve ever which is hard to uh <laughs> do we Cap do you not remember one. last <laughs> yeah. to be fair they're probably repressing it probably but spoiler it totally is the most exciting new year's eve ever <laughs> wow i am curious how they're gonna pull that off <laughs> so this book jumps between a couple of different characters points of view as most of the books do this one does it frequently but i tried to keep plot lines in order just for a little more coherency so there is an introduction now of a new character and this character's name is nora chappelle and oh okay <laughs> She's in Georgia. She's at a funeral for her father who just passed away. And oh, it's open casket. Is this Margot's crazy sister? I'm not telling you. There's an open, <laughs> why would I tell you that, Sam? How many twins are in this movie? If this is Margot's twin sister, I'm sorry, I said movie, but book. But if this is Margot's twin sister who is also <laughs> sociopathic, I'm calling shenanigans. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to find out in like <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> You'll know oh, everything. I can't <laughs> 
So she's at an open casket funeral. She's looking down at her father. She's having some deep thoughts because, you know, her father passed away. And he's in the coffin. She's contemplating that she's an orphan now because her mom passed away when she was little. But she feels kind of like she's been unloved and an orphan her entire life because she doesn't appreciate her father very much. Her mother, like I said, died when she was very little and she blames her dad for it because her mother was sick and she thinks her dad could have done more to to cure her, I guess. Okay. I know. It's some... Standard soap opera drama. Got it. (laughs) Yes. Soon after the death of her mother, her father actually marries again to a Southern Belle named Blanche and (laughs) she hates Nora. (laughs) Blanche there were some names. There were some names Blanche. in this book, Sam. <laughs> I think Tennessee Williams will have some words for this author. <laughs> One of the uh, characters that I won't get into was named Junebug. So, you know. <laughs> like, not the like, name, okay. actual name? <laughs> it seemed like it. <laughs> I am upset. <laughs> but Blanche is a stepmom. She's the evil stepmother. She hates Nora. She's extremely upset that her father died and left her with Blanche, which seems fair. So wait, Nora Ephron hates Blanche Dubois. Got it. Yeah, go with that. (laughs) And there is this weird note in the book that literally comes to nothing. I just wanted to share it because it made me laugh and I don't understand. I I kept thinking it was going to go somewhere. Like a footnote? No, like a note to this character that I'm about to tell you. So Nora can see smells. Like she can... She has like some kind of synesthesia? Yeah, she like if she smell something she can see the the color or the fog in the air like she visually can see a smell she, she think- actually visualizes odors in the air not just like synesthesia where this smells green yeah like That's she, she feels like she sees smells and she's been able to do it her whole life people don't really believe her and you think that would come up in the plot later on and it is yeah. referenced several times that she like sees a smell but it has no real bearing as far <laughs> like as far as i noticed in the entire story i was like why was that in the book <laughs> what is going on i don't know there's That's i mean every awful. time they mention nora they do talk about her like it's kind of very sensory when they talk about her and i'm sure that played into it but you think that would play some kind of major role if you're going to give right, a character like that she can see skill. where the killer is hiding by their deodorant or exactly whatever. but somehow no so i don't know why i was in there i just I thought it was really funny because i wrote it down as a note and it never really came back <laughs> i've done that a few times and yeah. i it makes you realize how structured stories are <laughs> how much you expect every sort of important detail to make an impact on the story mm-hmm. and when it doesn't how jarring it is yeah it's like, and you get kind of annoyed about it or like the why was it in there like people don't have characteristics that are never used in real life <laughs> I, I literally had a shower thought the other day about how stories are supposed to be very efficient. Like they mm-hmm. only have the information you need in them and none of the extraneous details that don't contribute. Yeah, so exactly. It's interesting when books decide to be inefficient and mention details that don't seem to have any character or plot relevance. Yeah, it's always an interesting author choice. And it's, upsetting. Like you I said, agree. jarring. Like jarring when you notice it and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they do that? Everything's supposed to mean something in a book. It's like the haunted forest in Lord yeah. of the Sky, which I was like, there was something in Lords of the Sky yeah, like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Haunted Forest, which was not important, but was mentioned <laughs> frequently and dreamed about. So I feel you. That is exactly this thing. Like, they mentioned the smell thing a lot, but it never actually becomes an issue or a plot point, particularly. <laughs> okay. It's very strange. <laughs> yeah. She overhears some attendees at the funeral talking about how composed she looks, and they think that it means that she didn't love her father. And they say the peach doesn't fall far from the tree. Her mother was well known to have insanity running in her family. Okay, so this is just ignorant about how mental illness works. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, it's kind of referenced in the book that it's clearly like not the best way to reference mental health issues. Yeah. Because it's not. But in any case, it's definitely something I think that like a lot of society kind of feels sometimes about mental health. I'm not saying there aren't genetic components in mental illness, but I'm also not going to say that, oh, crazy gives birth to crazy because that's wildly inaccurate and insensitive. Also, judging her emotions at a funeral and saying that she doesn't like feel enough, isn't expressing enough is really harsh. Like you don't know what's going on internally. (laughs) She's not so. 
suffering enough for her father's death. Go to heck, people. That's awful. You shouldn't be at this funeral. I would throw them out. Yeah. And internally, she's really upset about it, obviously. I mean, she has mixed feelings about her father, but she is upset that he's passed. It jumps ahead to after the funeral, and Blanche has called Nora into the library of the house, and she basically pulls a scar from Lion King. And she's like, run away and never come back. Why? Just <laughs> Because she hates her. And she's like, I've put up with you this entire time because your dad was a saint, and I'm not going to put up with you anymore. You're a terrible human being. You're crazy like your mom, and you should totally leave. And she's like, I'll give you $50,000 to disappear. And if you don't, I'm going to institutionalize you with your mother's history. Everybody will believe me. I'm a big oh, wig in okay. town. <laughs> got it. So She could pull strings. Yeah, I, I got that. I just wasn't <laughs> sure how she convinced Nora to take her up on the offer to run away. Yeah, they just kind of have a conversation. She's like, get out of here. But the conversation does continue. So they get into an argument and Nora gets angry at how she's speaking about her mother. Uh-huh. And Blanche says that she's as crazy as both her mother and her sister. And Ooh. Nora's like, wait, 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 back it up. I have a sister. <laughs> Who didn't, didn't see know. this coming? <laughs> Shocking. And Blanche scoffs. She's like, you're so stupid for never having guessed the truth. I'm like, why would she ever know that she right? had a sister? Not like you have to, like a, a mark on your arm which says, oh, <laughs> I am two uh, of two siblings. You know, it's crazy. So she says she has a twin sister named Margot, and they put her up for adoption years. It is a years. twin sister. <laughs> twins everywhere. Twins coming out of the woodwork. Twins that look exactly like other twins. Those are quadruplets, Danielle. I know. The real question is how Nora, Margot, Elizabeth, and Jessica all came to be. I think we need to speak to the parents. Yeah, there was some swinging going on, I'm thinking. (laughs) Nobody seems concerned about this at all. And so she finds out that her sister was put up for adoption years ago because she was the more terrible of the two children. Apparently she was like do that for a child because blanche talk okay so blanche talks the dead into it because the this is the conversation that's going on so this okay, is I'm all sorry. kind of I'm explained getting ahead of this because it's nonsense it's nonsense i agree so her father didn't want to originally but blanche talked her into it and blanche wanted to put both of the kids up for adoption like you know if we're gonna get married i don't actually want to start over with your crazy children but <laughs> they, they compromised quote unquote and they just gave up the one child and i was that's like not a compromise <laughs> is that <laughs> i i don't blame her for not loving her father he was terrible this woman is telling me my children are awful and i should get rid of them i'm gonna marry her <laughs> it's insane like it's like I, i'm glad the dad wasn't a character because i would have just been angry at him the entire book i am angry at him now even though he's <laughs> dead and still not a character in the book and i'm still angry with them yes definitely and Nora's stunned obviously this revelation but she's always felt like she was kind of alone and now she feels like she has somebody and she always felt like something was missing and now she realizes it's because she has an identical twin running around. Uh Uh-oh. And so, more plot twist. Blanche admits that she actually lied to Nora's father, and apparently Nora's father was the least active parent in this adoption in the entire world. Somehow even less active than the Wakefield parents. Exactly. She she admits that she told him that Margo was going to a good home, but she just put her into the New York foster system and was like, go, be a child of the state, Margo. (laughs) Wow, this is very, like, Dickensian. I know, it's insane. And she had some ties with the judge that worked in the New York family care system, and that's how she got her placed there. So she gives that information to Nora, and she's like, yeah, if it's going to make you leave town, like, I'll give you that. You can go find your sister for all I care. I don't want you to ever come back here. Does she get stabbed? I really want her to get stabbed. The Blanche? Yeah. I don't want to tell you. Okay. <laughs> So Nora storms off with her money. She takes the $50,000. She's like, I'm gonna go find my sister. Peace out. You suck. <laughs> Legitimate. Yeah. And then it swings back over to Elizabeth and Jessica. It's an evening caroling party because again, Christmas time. And Elizabeth is there. Jessica and Todd have not shown up and she's starting to get worried because they're, you know, 20 minutes late. Mm-hmm. And her friend is like, Jessica is always late to everything. She's probably just trying on clothes at home, probably stealing your outfits. She'll be here any <laughs> minute, I'm sure. And so don't be worried about it. And Todd's probably just running late. And this is before cell phones, you know, 1995. <laughs> right. So the scene switches to Jessica and sure enough she's trying on Elizabeth's clothes and she's realizing how late she is and Todd was running all these errands after school that day and they went longer than expected and he wasn't able to get the car repairs that he wanted to get done but he's rushing over to the caroling because he knows that he's late. Okay. He's speeding through the mountain roads in the dark and a shadowy- Oh, smart. I know. Always, always smart in books (laughs) or in life. 
a shadowy shape appears on the road. Todd slams his foot on the brake, and the pavement is slick with oil. Really slick, oil. I guess. I don't oh, know why there's no. oil on the road. <laughs> is Margot Stabbington trying to become Margot Slickington? Is this never explained as far as I know. It's just... <laughs> Okay. He's, I thought the shadowy figure would come back, like maybe somebody was plotting something. But yeah. as far as I know, Todd just has an accident. So it's just the rogue oil slick bandit. Yeah, I guess. Great. And so he skids across the road. And he tries to pump the brakes. They stop working, of course, because it's something that he was trying to get fixed on the car. And he spins. He slams into the guardrail. The car crumples. And he's thrown into the windshield. And the whole world goes black, it says. Oh, poor Todd. I know. He's the only boyfriend tough. that hasn't died yet. Yes. And remember, a year ago, there was another car accident. So history's repeating itself. Jessica is racing through the night now. She's on the same road that Todd is, farther back. She's trying to make it to the same event. And as she comes around the corner, she sees Todd's car, slams on her brakes, and she pulls over and gets out of the car and oh, goes over so to try and get Todd. she doesn't have problem with oil slick. Apparently not. Okay. And the car is actually, it went through the guardrail and it's dangling like slightly over the edge of the mountain cliff, of course. <laughs> of course. And a stray breeze pushes the car closer to the edge. A stray breeze. How windy is this freaking mountain? <laughs> Why not a butterfly landing on the hood? <laughs> it's insane. So she knows it's Todd's and she's having these flashbacks to when she found Elizabeth and Sam the previous year. She can't get into the car because the doors were all scrunched shut and it's a little too far off the cliff on the passenger side. And another gust of wind moves the car and she panics, but it finally rights itself. And she ends up breaking the driver's side window and dragging him through it. Somehow this doesn't rock the car enough to push it over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a breeze does. I know, Got it's it. insane. She's super worried that Todd is dead. And then meanwhile, back at the caroling event, they're all just still there waiting. They haven't started yet. They're now half an hour behind. And Elizabeth is afraid to leave the location, even though they know the supposedly know the plan of where they're going. And they're like, well, they'll just meet us up ahead. And then she turns back towards the road in town. And in the distance, she sees a ball of orange fire explode through the air and rise above through the trees. And Did she's Todd's like, car explode? Because I'll be upset. Apparently. It fell off the cliff and exploded. Because cars do that. <laughs> well, oil slick. I don't know. <laughs> it's on fire. <laughs> yes, oil. The well-known explosive. <laughs> I don't know, but it explodes, Sam. It explodes. And apparently this is like her twin intuition is not an effect, even though it works Danielle, every Danielle. time otherwise. <laughs> twin tuition, please. <laughs> twin tuition. Excuse me. So panic, she grabs her friend's keys and their phone and dials 911 and she races towards the explosion. I thought they didn't have cell phones. Well, they don't. It's 95. You don't have like good cell phones, maybe. <laughs> and her, the friend is Jessica's friend, I think. And Jessica's friend's super rich. So she probably does uh, have a cell phone. Those are like Motorola bricks. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Then it switches back to Nora. She's looking in the mirror. She's trying to envision what having a twin sister would be like, you know, what and what she looks like, which obviously she looks just like her. <laughs> You'd think. And she slowly sees, she swears that she sees Margot appear before her, like in the in the mirror. And she's angry that people thought they were allowed to separate them, which I think is a fair emotion to have. Legitimate. And yeah, and she tells the Margot in the mirror, like, we'll be together soon. I'm coming to find you. Hang in there. Then we'll get our revenge and somebody will pay for what they did to us. Oh, so, okay. She's starting to feel a little surly. And then she rushes off to New York to make that appointment with the ex-judge. Elizabeth shows up to the accident and they're already being taken to the hospital. And so she hightails it over to the hospital. And in the ambulance, Todd becomes conscious and he's thanking Jessica for saving him. And it's kind of unclear if he realizes it's Jessica or Elizabeth in the ambulance. Yeah, they're the same person. Well, they look identical and Todd is, you know, I know. I, I was kidding. <laughs> Jessica's in the ambulance with him, obviously. And she's super grateful that she was able to be there shortly after the accident. And she's really proud of herself for saving his life. She's like, this feels amazing. I should do this more often. So... Not killing people is better than killing them. Wow, it feels great when I'm not the cause of an accident and a death. It, it, it's great. Exactly. What a revelation. And she, and she does feel like it redeems her a little bit for like Sam's death in the previous novel, which she's finally I accepted think some Sam's of her blame in. Agree. <laughs> but it just feels like at least she like helped save somebody as opposed to contributing towards their death. Yes. Okay. So she's feeling closer than ever to Todd, of course. Uh oh. And yeah, I know. a love triangle. I will be not happy, Danielle. <laughs> I know how you love love triangles. They're your favorite things. I always try to find books and media that have love triangles in them for you. You are terrible. Why do I do this? 
<laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> Let me go out of my way. Okay, everybody. All of the rest of the media don't, from here on. Don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. I will end this podcast right now. <laughs> All right. Let us know if you would like love triangles every time I have an episode where I'm leading one. Please let me know. Oh, no, Danielle. Don't do this to me, please. <laughs> if we get overwhelming support for this idea, I will 100% do it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> So Todd's looking at her adoringly, of course, like, you saved my life. You're amazing. And she kind of thinks that he thinks that she's Elizabeth because of the look on his face. But she does explain that she's Jessica. So she's not a total terrible person. She's like, hey, Todd, you know, you're looking at me funny and I'm not Elizabeth. I'm totally Jessica. And Todd's like, ah, yeah, I actually knew that. <laughs> Todd, you dog. I know. He's kind of not great. Is anybody in these books actually redeemable? Uh... No, they're all very okay. human in that they're just kind of gr no, always no, no, gray no, 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 area. No, 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 no. This is not all oh, humans have flaws. These are legitimately awful people. Yeah, sometimes I would agree with that. It depends on the plot, but in terms of their emotional range, I think that often they're, they're I'm not... talking about in the books that I've experienced so far. <laughs> the one and two, the two, six yeah, books. Like the five, because you summarized that out of five books <laughs> yeah, or whatever. That's true. So from what I know so far, these people are terrible and Sweet Valley is a valley full of ranch dressing and horrible people that should be avoided. Yeah, I would agree that these books don't show them at their best. <laughs> you think? Yeah. So Todd's in the hospital. He doesn't have any major injuries, but he is, you know, broken up a bit, got a couple of broken ribs, an arm or something like that. The doctor mistakes Jessica as his girlfriend and neither of them correct him because, again, kind of terrible. Well, okay. <laughs> When do they get to the murder? Uh, soon. Okay. <laughs> Very soon. And then a news reporter shows up suddenly. He just like walks what? into the hospital room. This is a hospital room that minutes ago was family only and not even Elizabeth was supposed to be in there. And yet somehow a news reporter can walk in the door. Basically, he got permission from the doctor to come in and take That's their not picture. That's how that works. What a <laughs> terrible <laughs> doctor. I was actually talking to the book. I was like, um, no. <laughs> I know we have discussions about HIPAA during the Highlander episode, but I'm confident that HIPAA was a thing in the 90s, right? Yes. Didn't we look this up? We looked up when we HIPAA did, started. We did, and I really forgot when <laughs> HIPAA actually... Well, he doesn't ask him any questions because the doctor said no questions tonight. You know, Todd's pretty beaten up, but you can take a picture of them from the newspaper. He didn't even That's ask not them. Any better. How do you protect patient privacy? I don't know. Uh, even if HIPAA wasn't a thing, still... In 1995, which I I don't know, could be. If it wasn't, that's still awful. Yeah, I agree. But it happens. So the picture's taken. They the early first. And Jessica and Elizabeth are driving back that evening from the hospital and Oh no, she... oh no, oh no. No, it's okay. Is Nora <laughs> going to see the photograph and have the same dumb thought that Margot did that oh I can be her. Or that's Maybe. my twin. Maybe I'm not gonna tell you that. <laughs> okay. Anyways. These girls need to stop having their photos taken to put in the newspaper. It just causes trouble. That must be it. I mean, how are they to know that there's like a zillion people out there with their exact faces? So <laughs> yeah. Fair. So she's there's just a lot of tension between Jess and Elizabeth because they she's kind of Elizabeth is sort of feeling the connection between her and Todd and Jessica is not being her best self. And so that night, Elizabeth has one of her classic dreams from Great. the previous episode or prophetic dreams. And she has the same dream of the girl that looks like her but isn't and has a butcher knife. And she wakes up gasping and she's like, no, no, no. You know, Margo's well behind us. Margo's dead. It's fine. <laughs> Did you make sure she was dead? Yeah, apparently not. <laughs> nope. Nora, meanwhile, meets up with the, the guy, the judge, and he gives her all the information that she wants. Apparently, there are no rules. I don't know. <laughs> he just, like, well, gives her so much information. The doctor. What's with this? I mean, I know court records are often a matter of public record, but... Yeah, he just hands it over to her. Are adoption records public? Well, she was never adopted. She was just foster well, foster placed. records, whatever. Are those public? I don't think those are public. I don't Again, know. Again, I'm not a lawyer or a docter or much of anything, let's be honest. But <laughs> You're a doctor. I still feel morally <laughs> that these are not the correct choices for these people in their professional setting to be making. I absolutely agree. They are not correct choices to be making, but they all do make okay. these choices. <laughs> <laughs> no one is redeemable in this universe. Got it. <laughs> so he gives her the information on all her foster home placements, and he tells her, I have a hack your librarian friend if you need any like information that's off the what? record <laughs> that's what he tells her 
<laughs> what did this become hackers? Not that I'm not totally on board with crash and burn and all that, but what? We never meet that hacker librarian friend, which is really sad because I feel like it would have been a fantastic Why even addition. mention him if you're not going to use him to be like, I'm in. Because she, Nora gets some information from the hacker librarian friend, but she doesn't actually like talk to the hacker librarian friend, which is really a shame. How's she not, how's she information? All right, you'll tell me. <laughs> so she has the last known address of Margot, which she heads towards like a lower class neighborhood. She kind of contemplates how she wants to one day live in this utopia, and she's not convinced that it even exists, but she's, you know, trying to reach it with Margot, and she wants to find Margot, and she's convinced if she finds Margot, she'll be able to find this place and live with her, and everything will be happily ever after. That's how it works. It's true. Absolutely. So she shows up at the address, and it turns out there's no house at this address because there's just burned, burned down. ruins. Uh-huh. <laughs> Because huh? Margot, psychotic Margot, burned down her house, killed all the kids. <laughs> so we've learned now that Margot originated in New York. Uh, yeah, apparently. <laughs> okay, glad we got that tidbit. So she f- has all the information from the judge. And I think she, this is where she gets some information from the librarian as well. So she's back at her hotel room. So she has the information about the foster placement, the fire where Margot was presumed to be dead. But then uh-huh. she also has the following reports that James had with the police where she thought that Margot was the person who had killed his brother. Josh, you mean, not James. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry, Josh. <laughs> Josh is <laughs> they're so hard, Sam. They're so hard to I, keep apart. They're yeah, not even in this book. <laughs> And they're the same person. Josh, James, they're both... Well, Josh isn't dead, but w- what is he doing now? Uh, nobody knows. <laughs> Great. He left. He went back home to his mom. Oh, so he just decided to abscond on a revenge quest for yes. a few weeks, and then just returned home like nothing happened? Who are these people? <laughs> I don't know, but you never hear... I don't, as far as I know, you never hear from them again. Okay. And there is a police report in the pile that there may be a connection between Margot and the death of the young boy. She doesn't really think Margot would hurt any children without a good reason. Because <laughs> uh-huh. she does doesn't know Margo very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's our Margo. And there's also a bunch of articles about Elizabeth trial. And Nora realizes there's the same news article, I think, that, that Margo saw originally. Nora realizes she looks just like the girl in the newspaper. And isn't she that doesn't. suspicious? <laughs> And newspapers are black and white, for one. Well, so, maybe this and is the color. And often very blurry and not high quality. Isn't often like the Sunday papers that's all in color? Maybe that was it. Uh, Sunday papers, maybe, but I don't think they'd be putting like the mug shot in the, in the comic section where all the colors are. Well, I don't know if it was a mug shot. It might have just been a picture of Elizabeth, like local, you know, yeah, valid Victorian okay. <laughs> manslaughter. <laughs> yes. And newsprint is renowned for its high quality and, sh- and clear pictures. <laughs> well, if you're going to get stuck on this again, I swear to God, Sam, it's like an <laughs> Just I'm accept. sorry, Daniel. Uh, we can move on. I'm just saying they are not good at seeing faces. Maybe she has face blindness. Maybe. So she has she anesthesia sees, and face blindness. She sees the newspaper. She realizes she looks like her. She's looking in the mirror, kind of like contemplating how she looks like Elizabeth. And then she kind of sees Margot's image sort of float over her again and is like, dig deeper. And so she's like, okay, I'm going to keep searching. Like, there's got to be more, Ghost more Margo's information. Helpful. I know. Ghost Margot's amazing in this book. So as she's reading the articles, she starts to get mad at Elizabeth. She's like, this is my favorite quote. Despite her trial for manslaughter, Elizabeth Wakefield had never suffered. <laughs> what? That's not how that works. I'm like, I don't know. That's a pretty terrible thing to have to go through. <laughs> yeah. The death of your sister's Twin boyfriend. Twin sister's boyfriend. <laughs> potentially being responsible. A trial for manslaughter. And, and she knows all about the girl that, you know, stalked her and tried to kill her because it's all in newspaper clippings. So, like, it's a terrible she's life. She's never suffered, except for all that suffering she did. I mean, she's not Job, but <laughs> seriously. So she feels like Elizabeth has everything and would never understand the, you know, the trouble that Margo went through and the troubles that she's <sighs> gone through. And she has, she has information on everything. The caterer, the dirt bike racer, like, and then she finds out about Jessica and she's like, there's another one? <laughs> like, how are there so many of us? <laughs> That's a legitimate question. I'm curious. Is there like a cloning bat or something? Like, this is some kind of, okay, I've got it. I figured it out, Danielle. Oh my God, yes. I'm such a genius. <laughs> so there is an government sponsored underground cloning thing like <laughs> in the X-Men where they're just pumping out these clones trying to make the perfect teenage weapon. That's why they're all murderer. Yes, that's exactly what's happening. They're Plot also twist murderers the because end. they're trying to be the perfect killing machine. No one expect our pretty young twin girls of murdering them until they get up close to Fidel Castro whoever and stab them. Yes, that's what you find out actually in the return of the return of the evil twin. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the evil twin strikes back. <laughs> 
<laughs> the return of the evil twin strikes back. There you go. <laughs> Bay of Pigs. Yes. That's the next book. We'll, we'll go over that next episode. That'd be so, a better story. <laughs> as far as you know, you don't know that yet. That's, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> So towards the ends of all her paperwork, Nora finds out that Margot was stabbed by a giant piece of glass in the neck and that she, this is where we find out that the ambulance took her body away from the crime scene. And while riding to the hospital, the ambulance swerved off a bridge, nobody knows why, and the body of Margot was never recovered. Were the bodies of the ambulance driver and the EMTs recovered? I don't know. I was actually a little confused about that whole thing. I think I missed yeah. part of the book. <laughs> <laughs> like wait because like i actually figured out this information way at the end of the book and i was like wait a second this must have been earlier <laughs> i like, went back to this part so Margo's assumed dead and nobody in just assumed the northern bar is like let's just investigate this. yeah and and nobody in the wakefield world throughout this book seems remotely concerned about that like well Margo is dead they said she was dead even though they've never found her body she was definitely dead <laughs> this is seriously like the new halloween movie where everyone's like <laughs> Oh, you shouldn't worry about Michael Myers. He can't get to you now. And she's like paranoid about him, but it turns out to be right. Yes. It's Except exactly the like opposite, that. where people are not being paranoid when they absolutely should be paranoid. The entire last quarter of this book is basically Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on board. You, yeah. may, you may have turned me around on this yet. Excellent. So that night, Nora has her own weird twin dream. <laughs> I guess that's all we have in this book. There are like 20 dreams. I'm in so this done book. with dreams. <laughs> so she has a dream about digging out an unmarked grave and she feels like it holds a message. So she heads towards Sweet Valley, of course, to see if uh, she can track more of Margot's trail. And she also kind of like feels like she can feel Margot, like she's having the twin sensation. And she's getting angry and angrier that Margot died, but the other twins survived. Why? Because I don't know. There's like no real, there's no reason to be that upset about some people you didn't know. But she's basically on Margot's side. Well, Margot's my twin, you know, my soulmate. I'm on Margot's side. Clearly, if the twins, you know, were involved in her death, the twins deserve to pay. That's her whole logical point. Checks out. <laughs> So the next morning, Elizabeth is feeling pretty jittery, and she writes down all of her feelings in her journal. And <laughs> stop leaving their journals where people can read them. I know. My favorite line in it was, I never understood then how my subconscious knew that Margot was stalking me, and how it knew that she looked exactly like me and Jessica. Which is a great question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding, because it wouldn't, and it doesn't. <laughs> but somehow she knew last book. So she kind of brushes off the dream just because so much has been happening that's so similar to the previous year. So she brushes it all off. And meanwhile, there's the story comes out in the newspaper and it says that Todd's girlfriend saved him from the the car. And so now it's kind of uh -oh. spread through the school and the town and everybody, you know, originally thinks Elizabeth saved him. And they're like, Elizabeth, no, 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 it was Jessica. And Jessica's kind of like getting full of herself, a little peacocky about it. And pee hen, pee hen, pee hen about it. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work as well because they don't look very good. You know. And there are several run-ins where Todd and Jessica are into each other, or at least like constantly thrown together. And well, it'll... we already know she's his type. Yeah, because... yeah I know. <laughs> There's a line somewhere later in the book, I wasn't going to bring it up, but it made me laugh, where he's like, I never realized how beautiful Jessica was. And I was like, it's your <laughs> twin! It's like the twin sister! It's identical to your current girlfriend! Either you didn't think she was very attractive, or you're an idiot. Yeah, I was like laughing out loud when I read it. I was like, what, Todd? What? <laughs> Todd, not the brightest bulb. <laughs> no. None of these people are that bright. Oh. And he's like super perplexed why Elizabeth is being so weird and standoffish. I'm like, this is not that hard to figure out, Todd. He is not. He's a terrible boyfriend. Uh, and he's just not that smart, I think. Poor, poor Todd. <laughs> what about Ken? Where is Ken the linebacker? He's kind of in this background. Whatever. He's kind of on Elizabeth's side. Like, yeah, they're acting super weird. Jessica's a little full of herself right now. You know, give her a break. And, and Todd just, you know, had a life-changing experience. So, But he's trying to like, he's trying to always tone it down whenever they're together in groups. So. Ken's on Elizabeth's side. Good, good, good guy, Ken. Yeah, he doesn't have a lot to do with this book, but he he seems like a decent dude. So Nora arrives in Sweet Valley. She has her new plan, and you might have guessed that her new plan is to avenge Margot's death. <laughs> by paying that was not my first guess but it makes sense <laughs> by paying tribute to the life she wanted and then revenging on the twins is basically her her main goal so she's decided to Wait, how does she pay tribute to the life she she's okay so if margot 
She's decided that if Margo can't be part of the twins' world, then Nora is going to be part of the twins' world in Margo's place. Okay, here's a question I have. Yes. Did everyone figure out that Margo's plan was to take Elizabeth's place? Because that would not be my first conclusion. Yeah, because I think it was when, is it Josh or James, <laughs> one of the J's, saw all the pictures in her room and all the serial killer walls oh, and was all like, oh, she right, wants to be right, Elizabeth. Right. She had her serial killer hideout. And then Todd figures it out at some point and they just, yeah, they figured okay, it out. Okay, okay, okay. So the police right, know right. that this was the motive for Margot. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. So she buys a blonde wig, Nora does, and looks up where they live and basically starts a stalking, just like Margot. And anytime someone buys a blonde wig in Sweet Valley, it should immediately <laughs> trigger like a background check and a, an alert. Yeah, no, they're not that competent. So she's pretty astounded by how close she looks to the twins, of course, because she's basically going through the same process that Margot did, only she's a little less manic The story's so nice, we did it twice. (laughs) Basically. So that night, she visits Margot's grave in town, and heeding her intuition, she digs up the grave, and it's empty, which, duh, because they never found the body, but... (laughs) Right. Why would they even be a grave? Well, they did like a, I guess, some local nonprofit or something for troubled kids troubled quote unquote teens. it was like in support of that gave her a, a okay. headstone so she keeps kind of hearing Margot's voice in her head and she kind of realizes that if she shies away from the plan of avenging you know the death that Margot's voice sort of disappears but if she keeps on track then Margot's voice comes back and she's like I don't want to lose Margot you know I just finally got her I need to keep her so I'm gonna definitely kill the twin one of the twins great good plan <laughs> yeah so that night everybody has dreams <laughs> Nora has her dream again. Can we just skip the dreams? Yeah. Jessica has one about Elizabeth. Uh, that's like unfamiliar eyes. Dreams abound. And it's now Christmas morning. So we've rushed ahead here. Yay. Yay, Christmas morning. And the twins... Your present is trauma. <laughs> yes, actually it is. The twins... <laughs> <laughs> it's wrapped in a pretty box. It has a bow. You open it up. You're like, yay, trauma. <laughs> and no therapy. More baggage. <laughs> So the twins have decided to reconcile in the spirit of the holidays. So Elizabeth... Reconcile for what? That Elizabeth was being so, like, angsty about her and Jessica and Todd kind of living it up together. And Jessica was being super into herself. And so it's like a minor spat, but they weren't really talking to each other. So Elizabeth apologizes for being jealous. And she knows that Todd, you know, isn't into Jessica. And Jessica's like, I'm sorry, I was so into myself. And so they do realize that they've been having the same dreams, which you might remember in the previous episode, they weren't talking to each other. So they never realized that. (laughs) Which is legitimately crazy. Yeah. So they realize they're having these dreams again, but they're like, you know what? It's probably just because of all the weird stuff that's been happening. It's definitely not prophetic or anything, even though all of our dreams are. (laughs) These people are not... Good at self-preservation. I know. So, Nora goes back to the cemetery that night. She's in a blonde wig for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. I was a little perplexed. Because she likes it, Danielle. Don't judge her fashion choices. Yeah, she's wearing the blonde wig. She's she's pretending to be one of those twins, I guess. She wants to spend Christmas with her sister. She is a twin, Danielle. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I met one of the other twins. Oh, okay. There's so many twins I forgot. I know. Sorry, I'll say it more clearly. <laughs> Which twin I'm talking about. <laughs> Which set which, of which twins that are all not great people? Which of the four twins I'm discussing? So uh, <laughs> there are probably more. It's probably there is actually another set of twins that comes up towards the end of this book. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. There's not, or is there? Oh, you had me. I would have believed it because this is just that crazy. I know. So she goes back. She's at the cemetery again. She's spending the night with her sister. Quote unquote. I mean, she's not there, but she's sitting next to the gravestone. You kind kind of chatting with her mentally. And she gets jumped from behind. Somebody jumps her. So they is that Margot? Please be Margot. They grapple, and during the fight, the wig comes off. The blonde wig comes off, and the person suddenly stops fighting Nora and turns on like a a lighter, fl- flicks a lighter on, and because it's, it's dark in there, and Nora realizes it's someone who looks exactly like her. It's yeah. Margot. Yeah, yeah, we figured that out, Danielle. <laughs> Return of the evil twin. <laughs> <laughs> They're both the evil twin, Danielle. Yes, they are. So wait, if they're both the evil twin, what? That that doesn't make any sense. Like how? All right. (laughs) Just go with it. Okay. Uh, So the next scene is in Nora's hotel. They've gone back together. Nora explained the twin thing. And Margo's like, yeah, that makes sense. I always kind of thought there was another person out there like me. I've, you know, been missing something my entire life. Twin seems legit. (laughs) 
I mean, you do They're look like me. They're all remarkably okay with this. Yeah, she's like, that's so unsurprised by it. It actually almost skips over it in the book. It's just like accepted that they are like, yeah, we're twins. And Nora wants to know how Margo fooled everybody about being dead, which, you know, good question. Yeah, I was about to ask that same question of you. <laughs> so Margo explains that she can hold her breath for over three minutes and she can slow her pulse <sighs> rate down. <laughs> <laughs> what is she a free diver what the heck she's been practicing for years quote unquote <laughs> for just such an eventuality know, just to escape case. from an ambulance i hijacked into a bridge <laughs> over some water and dove off well she has like a gushing bloody wound from her neck like that was the first thing on her mind is slow your pulse right down and hold your breath because i need to think i'm dead <laughs> To be fair, slowing your pulse rate down while you're bleeding to death would be a good Super plan. Super easy, yeah. <laughs> but also, what the heck? Why didn't she bleed out? She got like her neck sliced open. There's some pretty important arteries in there. I know she has a scar, so you know. So she does she does she talk mm, like this? She doesn't seem to, but. Oh. Actually, Nora has in her head a scratchy voice, and now that you say that, I wonder if it's <laughs> <laughs> I really hope she really talks like a gravelly old woman. I'm Margot Stabbington. We're going to take revenge on the Wakefield twins. <laughs> yeah, that's what she says, and that's definitely how she says it. Okay. Well, in my head, that's all that happens okay. now. Just all she sounds like is gravelly voice, old lady. All right. If any lines come up of Margot's, I'll let you know you can do them in that voice. Oh, thank you. You're I'd love welcome. that. <laughs> this is my audition reel. <laughs> So apparently she, I don't remember what she did, but she attacked the ambulance drivers. They swerved off the bridge. She dove out of the door as it fell and she survived. She's she's Jason Bourne. She's basically Jason Bourne. <laughs> okay. She's amazing. She's like Margot Bourne. Freeborn. <laughs> Margot reborn. <laughs> So Nora's in awe of Margot, just like thinks she's like the coolest thing. And she, fair, that's pretty impressive. I know. I, I do, yeah. She wonders if they too have a psychic connection like the Wakefield twins do. And she that asks never manifested before this point. Yeah. And she asks Nora if she hears voices. And Nora is like, Well, you know, just lately I've been having some dreams and I swear I hear you in my head sometimes. <laughs> and Margo's like, Yeah, totally. Psychic okay. twin stuff. Yeah, okay. So Nora fills Margo in on some of the information she's learned, like that the twins are hosting that New Year's Eve carnival, and Margo gets all excited about a house of beers. She's like, ooh, that has possibilities. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> <laughs> she is a prankster with murderous intent. <laughs> I know. Kind of great. So <laughs> Nora's a little confused, like, well, you know, you're not dead, so why are we avenging anybody? And Margo's like, <laughs> Margo's like, are you kidding me? Like, it's a perfect life, and we could fill it in. Like, let's do this. <laughs> so they want to do a double swap they totally do you got there so i got there nora not quite as on the ball as old sam who's not the sam who's dead in this book <laughs> exactly but she jumps on board pretty fast she's like killing yeah i'm good let's do it <laughs> So meanwhile, the twins attend the local carnival that's, you know, going all week or whatever, just to get a feeling for what it's going to be like for the New Year so they know what the games are and all that kind of stuff, just to get a general sense. Elizabeth decides to try out the fortune teller, and during her palm reading, the fortune teller's face goes pale, and she's like, there's more than one of you. <laughs> and, and Elizabeth is like, uh, yeah, but to when? <laughs> And the fortune teller's like, oh, okay, totally cool. <laughs> and then, no, the fortune teller, of course, is like, it's not just a twin. You need to be very careful. Or you're not going to reach New Year's Eve alive. <laughs> There's more than two of you. <laughs> she brushes that off, does she? She totally does. She's like thrown off by it, but she's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Okay. So next day, twins are getting ready for a carnival planning session, and Nora and Margo are staking out the house dressed as the twins. They, like, bring a bunch of clothes with them, and because Margo kind of knows what the outfits were like because she was stalking them for so long. And so they actually dress up like the twins, and when the twins leave to go to their to their event, their planning, they sneak into the house, and they have, like, a whole conversation with the parents, which we have already discussed. The parents never notice. <laughs> they are not good parents. <laughs> they like, they just don't even. They're just like, oh, why are you back? And they're like, oh, Je Jessica's like fake Jessica. It's like, oh, I spilled something on my shirt. I've got to go change it. And they have a nice conversation with the parents. And Nora's like super excited about it because they made it through. And their parents are so nice and so cool. And their life is so great. They're totally gonna take I it guess. over. Yes, the parents are very negligent. So yes. good luck with that. Well, it's better than what they had before, I guess. That 
that's fair. So during all this, they find out that Elizabeth is going to a movie that night with one of her friends. And so Nora calls Todd and is like, let's go to a movie tonight. And so she goes to the same movie with Todd. And she is just as feisty as Margo about making out with Todd. Because apparently Todd's a hottie. <laughs> and- <laughs> we already established he's not that smart. He has to have something going for him. Yeah. So she goes, they go to the movie. They sit like in the front row. And Elizabeth oversees Todd during the movie making out with Nora. And she and thinks, she thinks it's, it's Jessica. Jessica. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because they've I've had seen that whole- sitcoms. Yeah. So she runs home. And the real Jessica is actually just showing up from her actual date with her real boyfriend. <laughs> and Elizabeth confronts her. And they get into the biggest fight. And Jessica is like, dude, I was with Ken. I don't know what you're talking about. We were at the movie, but we were in the back. Like, we weren't. I don't know what you're talking about. And Elizabeth is like, I'm not having a rational conversation right now. It's all your fault. She literally says, I'm not having a rational conversation. She wasn't. (laughs) And she refuses to believe her and storms off, which is insane to me because I have a very recent history of evil twins. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Maybe you hear her out. (laughs) <laughs> this is another one of those plots where five minutes of conversation would solve everything. I know. And the plan, actually, I didn't mention this, but Margo and Nora hatch up this plan and they're like, let's make the twins stop talking because if they're not talking, then we can get away with anything because they're not. No, what? Because if they're not talking, then we can screw with them each and they're never going to know anything's going on. But and why so screw with them at all? Why don't you just murder them in the house of mirrors and call it a night? Yeah, that would be a better solution, but they like to play cat and mouse, I guess. Why? Why even prime them? Why even give them a warning. I don't These know why they that awful. night why they didn't just kill them. I don't know. They're like delaying it. <sighs> okay. That's why they do the thing at the movies. This book should be like five pages long. So twins are thrilled. The, the evil twins. Margot and Nora. <laughs> just clarifying because you said you were confused with the twins. That was true. And then they start arguing over who gets to be Jessica which I think is hilarious because last episode and book it was all about Elizabeth and now they're like I want to be Jessica. No I want to be, be Jessica. Well Nora wants to try being her because she says that she was always forced to be an Elizabeth her entire life with Blanche, like perfect. And she wants to be and, rebellious. And she wants to be rebellious and be one like Jessica and have do whatever she wants to do. And Margot's like, I think I got caught last time because I was pretending to be Elizabeth and I'm clearly more like Jessica, so I should get to be Jessica. And, oh, man. And so they get into this argument <laughs> about who gets to be which twin. <laughs> and Nora's concerned thinking that once she found Margot, everything would be perfect and work out and happily ever after and they'd never argue and now of course they're arguing and so she's like I don't quite know what's going on here I but I really want to be Jessica and Margot basically refuses to back down and is like we'll talk about it later. And Someone's so, getting stabbed. <laughs> lots of people are getting stabbed. The night of the New Year's Eve carnival commences. Both Todd and Finally. Jessica I know, try to talk to Elizabeth but she brushes them off because plot and Todd then tries to talk to Elizabeth's friend who also saw them at the movie theater making out. And she basically gets mad at him for bringing it up and brushes him off as well. And he's just like mystified about what's going on, which again, all of them know there was a yeah. crazy evil twin whose body Why was never nobody found. nobody talk in this? <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's just like puzzling to me. So it Jessica, is baffling. Jessica is not working the carnival, of course. She's like, I came up with the idea. I'm not doing work while I'm here. You do it, Elizabeth, because, you know, that's what she's like. And so she's joining the carnival with her boyfriend. And then she decides she wants to go into the Hall of Mirrors. And Ken is, is basically like, nope, they freak me out. I'll go get some cotton candy. You go through. We'll meet back up at the dance in a little Ken bit. Ken is a real good guy. Yeah, well, he doesn't know that she there's an evil plan. That's fair. <laughs> So she also t- tries to convince one of her friends to go in with her, but her friend's like, you know, I want to stand in line and see the fortune teller. You go. So she- Jessica goes in alone. And once she's in there, of course, she starts to feel uneasy because she sees all the Jessicas spread across the mirrors, you know? And the mm-hmm. more she looks at them, the more she kind of has flashbacks to the evil twin situation. She kind of panics. She starts getting like, a little bit of an anxiety attack. And she basically is trying to reason herself like, these are just mirrors. Like, I can find my way out of this. This is a thing for kids. Like, I can totally do this. And then she pauses for a moment to gather her wits and then out of the corner of her eye she sees one of the reflections and it keeps moving even though she's stopped. Oh. Yeah. And it cuts scene and it's back at the hotel room and Nora's there alone and she realizes that Margot's taken off and she's like, she went to terrorize the twins alone. <laughs> I don't understand this whole plan to terrorize him. Just kill him! I know, I agree. So she's like getting angry at Margot. She's like, I've proven myself. I did all this stuff. I was totally on board. I pretended to be one of the twins and made it. Why can't Margot just believe 
believe that I can do this? And why would she go alone on this? So the more she looks at herself in the mirror, the more she kind of sees Jessica. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to show everybody that I mean business. I'm going to go and I'm going to take down Jessica and I'm going to take over her life right now. So Elizabeth is working the carnival. Back to the carnival. And one of Jessica's friends comes up and asks where Jessica's been. It's been like two hours since she went to the Hall of Mirrors and nobody's seen her. And Elizabeth is really still angry with Jessica. She's like, I don't care. <laughs> and as, as they're talking, Jessica shows up. And, just, you know, I'm really tired. I'm going to go home. And everybody kind of looks at her. She's like, I don't want to talk about it. And she just leaves. And Nora shows up at the Wakefield house. And she has watched Jessica return. Oh, I see where this is going. And she wa- addiction. Yes, of course. Perfect timing. Nora, I had the thought earlier that one of them was going to kill the other thinking it was one of the Wakefields. Uh huh. So I'm thinking that Nora is going to kill Margot or take her down or whatever, thinking or try to, thinking that she's Jessica because she's taking over Jessica's life. Maybe. You'll have to see. I thought it was going to be the other way around where Nora was going to take over someone's life and Margot would kill them in revenge or something like that. But well, you'll have to find out soon, in fact. Minutes. Hurry. Minutes from now. <laughs> I must know. <laughs> Nora shows up the Wakefield house and she sees the twins come home. Their parents are at a New Year's party. And of course, the parents, the most negligent parents ever. <laughs> they don't know that there's a murder, but you would think they'd be a little closer to home or at least at the carnival since it's like the anniversary of yeah. them almost dying. <laughs> So after being sure that the twins are asleep, she sneaks into the house and climbs up the stairs, making her way to Jessica's room. And she questions whether she should wait for Margot, but she decides she absolutely can't be Elizabeth. She just does not want to be her. And so she's going to kill Jessica and take over her life before Margot can. So she sneaks into Jessica's room and she's watching her sleep and she draws her knife And as she's about to plunge it in Jessica's chest, in a move that is classic Margot, she stops to wonder if she can really kill someone that looks exactly like her. Oh, not this (laughs) again. It's just like killing herself. (laughs) But like Margot, she overcomes the urge. She she picks up a pillow. She holds it to Jessica's face and then she stabs her (laughs) multiple times and theoretically killing her because she looks pretty darn dead. Yep. So in the other room, Elizabeth wakes up. She has a prophetic dream. (laughs) She does. And she knows something's wrong. She stumbles into her sister's room, and Nora is caught next to the bed. Nora was just trying to figure out, like, where do I put this body? And Nora's yeah, and caught. All the blood. <laughs> yeah, all the blood. Like, it's just a terrible plan. So Nora's caught next to the bed. Elizabeth, like, runs forward. She thinks Margot's returned, obviously, because that would be yep. the logical solution. And Nora rushes for the window, climbs out, runs across the yard, and escapes. The parents return. 911 is called, and. Trauma ensues. Got abs- it. Absolutely. Jessica is still alive. Barely. So they gather at the hospital. They, she's taken to the hospital. And they're making a last-ditch attempt to save Jessica. And Elizabeth is blaming Margot. But her parents are like, okay, <laughs> sure, it's dead Margot. Like, clearly you're just... like the parents having- are awful! Well, they don't say it like that. They're just like, you know, let's talk about this later when you've had some, when we've had some time to... So what do I think happened? Do you think she stabbed herself? No, they, they know they believe that somebody was in the room. I kind of thought for oh. a minute they were going to blame Elizabeth, yeah, like think that she had that. done something because they'd been in a big fight and they knew that and all that. Like they believed that somebody was in the room. They just didn't believe it was Margo. They thought that maybe she was just having some like past trauma because they, she saw somebody in the room and thought like, oh, it must be Margo. Right. So, but they just don't think it's Margo. They do think somebody was in the room. Obviously, everybody's really upset. Parents are upset. Elizabeth's upset. And a doctor comes out to inform them that Jessica didn't make it. So she did die. Aww, I that's Margot's dead. So sad. The police question Elizabeth in connection with the murder, and they also don't particularly believe her story about Margot. <laughs> Doing their bang-up job as usual. As always. And meanwhile, Nora's chastising herself in a hotel room like, I should have waited for Marco. I totally screwed this up. Now Jessica's dead and I can't replace her because they know she's dead. Yeah. <laughs> and so she keeps hearing a voice in her head, the scratchy voice I was talking about earlier. And it keeps saying, and then there was one, and then there was one over and over. You gotta say it, Sam. You say and it then one. there was one. <laughs> and then there was one. <laughs> Just like that. I'm Margo. <laughs> So she I'm re- dead now. <laughs> Maybe you don't know. <laughs> I I I wouldn't know if I'm dead because I'm Margot. <laughs> Good call, actually. 
That's fair. I mean, if you, if you are Margo, you would know whether or not you're dead. I think so. So Nora rushes to the mirror. The voice keeps repeating itself. And then it ends with shouting out the name Elizabeth. And Nora smiles at herself, deciding if she can't be a Jessica, well, then obviously she'll just kill Elizabeth and be her instead. It worked <laughs> so well the last time. The only logical solution. And she wants to be part of this perfect family. And nothing's going to stand in her way, not even Margo. <laughs> so she's turned on her twin pretty quick. Yep. So the next morning she wakes up. Margo hasn't come back yet. And Nora contemplating Margot's strong tendencies towards murder as her go-to solution, <laughs> suddenly realizes that Margot must obviously know what Nora is trying to do and is planning to kill her so she can become Elizabeth. Makes sense. Absolutely, right? So the only solution is to kill Margot before she can kill Nora, and then she'll kill Elizabeth and become her. So I'm sure this is like a Highlander list. sequel, <laughs> because there can Actually, be only one. No, it's hysterical. Oh my gosh, I was just about to tell you that. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's basically high school version Highlander Gathering because this is a direct quote from Nora. In the end, there could be only one. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, Highlander with teens. I'm on board. You turn me down. around, Danielle. I was like, Woo, Highlander. <laughs> <laughs> oh <Maybe I'm>, uh, <laughs> no! Yeah, it would have been a great Highlander. One of the uh, sequels. <laughs> it very well could be. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> So the Wakefields decides to host a service at the high school auditorium for um, Jessica. And apparently 2,000 people show up, which, good job, Jessica. Like, what? Way to be popular. That's a lot of people. <laughs> I wouldn't want that many people show up at my funeral. Yeah, that's a lot that of people. That means way too many people know me. <laughs> it's crazy. So Nora is there, of course, because she's convinced that Margo's going to show up to it, because obviously Margo would. So she's kind of like sneaking around in the back there, and she can, f she feels like she can feel her like in in the room. She knows that Margo's somewhere in there. And after the service, Todd she goes can to see, smell her, you smell her. Yeah, it's possible. <laughs> There's a lot of smell references, but again, they don't have any plot bearing. After the service, Todd goes to support Elizabeth, and she basically is like, yeah, but to I totally forgive you because I know it was you and Margot making out, and it clearly wasn't Jessica. And Todd's like, okay, crazy pants. <laughs> then who did Todd think he was making out with? Elizabeth. He thought he was on a date with Elizabeth. And the she says, I was not there, and he's like, I think you were. Yeah, he's like, yeah, like clearly you're having some trauma from Jessica dying. Like he just attributes it to that. Todd, I know. My there's dude. so many points. Like there's so many points where you're like, you guys, there was an evil twin like two seconds ago. <laughs> it's insane. Oh. So he offers to take Elizabeth over to the cemetery for the burial. And as they're walking down the school hallway, Elizabeth suddenly pauses. And her eyes widen. And she's positive that she just felt Jessica. And she's like, Todd, I'm pretty sure she's still alive. Maybe she's still alive. I think she is. I can feel her. Like, I feel her in the school somewhere. Oh, she's in the school. Ooh. Yeah, he thinks in school. And Todd's like, dude, you saw her dead body, like, yesterday. <laughs> she's super dead. <laughs> For this one, I'm with Todd. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth's convinced, like, convinced that something's going on, and she just can't quite put all the pieces together. She doesn't know what she's missing, but she's just like, something's happening. And as they're talking, Jessica's friend comes up and is confused to see Elizabeth, because she's like, I thought you were just backstage on the in the auditorium. And Elizabeth, like, wait a second. <laughs> So I'm not saying that uh, Elizabeth shouldn't know that something's up because obviously she's seen Margot, she or you know what she thought was Margot, and she's having her twin vibes. But if her idea is actually two evil twins, like that's a crazy idea to have in reality. No, it is. It, Margot coming back is one thing, but thing is another yeah. set of evil twins is is ludicrous. Yeah. So if that's actually her thought, like good job on Elizabeth. I guess she's a freaking genius. So Elizabeth is trying to convince everybody that Jess is alive, and everybody's like, yeah, no, that's not. No, no. Like, you're clearly having some serious issues with the death of your twin, understandably. And after the service, Nora wanders around the school because she's, like I said, she feels Margot in the building. So she's wandering around the building. She follows the feeling, I guess, <laughs> until she hears a noise. And then she follows the noise, which is like a banging sound that's coming from inside the furnace room. And she can quote unquote, feel evil oozing from the room and knows Margot is staying there, you know, planning her revenge. And the door is locked, so she can't get into it. But she decides to, quote, come back after dark when her powers were at their full strength. What is she, a werewolf? What? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so that night, Elizabeth has a dream where Jessica's alive and telling her to find the key, find the key. She has no idea what the heck that's supposed to mean. Key to the boiler room, come on. This is mm -hmm. obvious. Yep. 
And the next day, that kind of later that day, the police show up to talk to Elizabeth again now that she's had some time to kind of deal with it. So they're questioning her. Elizabeth keeps like looking at the holster of the policeman and the policeman thinks that maybe it is throwing Elizabeth off. So they take the holster off and put it off to the side table. And Elizabeth is talking to them and basically says, my story hasn't changed at all. It's definitely Margot. I mean, if it wasn't Margot, then it must have been Margot's twin sister. And then she kind of has like a moment where she's like, oh my God, there's a twin sister. <laughs> That's not, no, 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 no. This is like in every sort of detective movie where they're like, at a bar and they're like at the end of the rope and they say, oh, you know, if only we had one more shot. Wait, say that again. One more shot. Shot! That's it! <laughs> it's exactly like that. Like, unless she has a twin sister. Oh my god, she has a twin sister! And you're like, what? <laughs> no, like, why would that be BS, your first no. thought? <laughs> So she leaves the room. The cops continue talking to the parents, and she steals the gun out of the holster of, from the police smart, person. Smart move. Great yeah. idea. So, and then she s- goes back to the high school that evening. Nora also sneaks back into the school and breaks into the furnace room, and Elizabeth's arriving at the same time. They don't see each other, obviously. And so uh, Elizabeth is walking through the school, trying to find Jessica. She's positive she's there somewhere, and she's trapped by Margot. And she considers calling the police, but there just isn't time, which I'm like, you had all day. You <laughs> literally were just with the police. You could have been like, I'm positive she's there. They probably would have humored you. You're grieving. You're small town. Just search the school, <laughs> right? Not right. hard. So I don't even know. But she starts near the auditorium because that's kind of where she felt the original pull of Jessica. And so Nora is walking down the stairs into the furnace room and she sees a shape ahead of her in the room and she rushes at it with her knife intent on killing Margot and a fight ensues. And Margot gets a hold of the knife and pulls it from her. And Elizabeth hears the noises upstairs and she runs through the school, runs down, turns... If this ends with what I predicted from last time, which is I don't know which one to shoot, <laughs> I will be very upset. She turns on the lights, lights spill into the staircase down into the furnace room. The story suddenly switches points of view to Jessica, who is, of course, the one trapped in the furnace room fighting yeah, yeah, with Nora. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> I'm no Elizabeth with my ability to jump to conclusions, but I figured that out. <laughs> so she was kidnapped by Margot in the Hall of Mirrors and, for some reason, breaking with tradition, not murdered. <laughs> like <laughs> Just stash in the boiler room. Yeah, Margot kills on the drop of a dime. Like, all the time, Margot kills people. And then this one time, she's like, I think I'm going to hide you in the furnace room. <laughs> Doesn't that, like, blow up her spot, though? Because it's totally like, hey, you know she's in here. If she ever gets out, it's going to totally, you know, ruin your whole plan. I I don't know what her plan was, and we will never find out. (laughs) So... She's not murdered. She's tied up and attached to a wall with like a length of cord, like a dog. So her hands are tied up and she's tied to the wall. But she got the knife out somehow. From- well, she grabbed like just during the fight because it was in the dark. She managed to pull it from Nora. So she thinks she's fighting with Margot, of course. And she loses control of the knife again with the scuffle because she's very weak. She's been there for a couple of days now and she's had a little bit of water, but no food. And above, Elizabeth starts to run down the stairs and Jessica uses the surprise of Elizabeth's arrival to knock the knife from Margot Nora's hand. And as they both lunge for it, they stop because Elizabeth appears with her pistol trained on the two girls. And she can't tell who is who, Sam. <laughs> Here's a clue, Elizabeth. The one who's tied up is probably not <laughs> Margot. My notes in capital letters said, Jess is tied up. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't think Jessica would be kidnapping Margot and tying her up. Maybe the one who is not tied up is the evil. Oh. She seems so perplexed. I was like, this is not a hard decision. This isn't like the party where they're wearing the same dress and looked identical. Literally, one is tied to a wall, Elizabeth. Also, here's a thought. You know, maybe just keep your gun at them and get some help. <laughs> but no, Elizabeth chooses correctly and has Jess cut herself loose because, duh, that's Jessica. <laughs> yeah. And Jess questions, like, how did you know about Margot? And Nora is shocked, shocked, I tell you, because Jessica is not Margot and she was somehow convinced also, that Margot was tied Jessica up. Also, not and- figure out that Margot wouldn't tie herself up to a boiler? Yeah, no. I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know. So Nora thought that Margot had apparently tied herself up to a boiler in the furnace room (laughs) and so elizabeth is like no 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 there's two of them they're also identical twins but nora killed Margot, thinking it was you (laughs) and and nora's like i didn't kill i killed i killed (laughs) Margot." 
and then the police show up for some reason. I don't, I don't know. Well, I know why. Oh, it's- it is Highlander. They just show up when they needed to. <laughs> they show up because she had been talking a lot to her brother about how she thought Jessica was at the school. And then when they noticed that the gun was missing, they're like, maybe she went to the school. So they show up at that. Oh, the first good detective work they've done all <laughs> series. Pretty much. So they show up just in the nick of time. Everybody apologizes for not believing Elizabeth. And then they have a welcome back from the dead party for Jessica. And everybody I'm lives. Nora is detained in some way. Yes, she's the police show up. I was kind of like assuming that meant that I assumed that Nora was taken I would into hope custody. So. Just let her go. Like it's fine. Shenanigans. <laughs> Nora is probably put in jail and probably escapes in a later book. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> sure. I would not be surprised. The strike back at the return of the evil twin. <laughs> exactly. So they have a welcome back from the dead party for Jessica, and then everybody lives happily ever after. The Until end. the next book. <laughs> Until the evil twin strikes back. That was somehow dumber than <laughs> It's like Not, the exact same plot dumb. with an extra twin. <laughs> I, I don't mean dumb as like the story. It's, I mean, every character in this book was somehow behaving in a dumber way than they did in the previous book. They were all smarter in the previous book. I know, which is saying a lot because they weren't that smart in the first no. book. <laughs> so somehow they managed to behave in even dumber ways because they had all the information from the first book and they still didn't know how to use it. I know. It's really, really impressive, honestly. The amount I of times they had shocked. conversations where they were just like, but it wasn't like it wasn't you. It wasn't me. And I'm like, twins, there are evil twins with bodies and missing. And you know Margot's body wasn't found. That's what threw me off is because like halfway through the book, two thirds of the way through the book, I suddenly realized I was like, wait, Margot's body was never found. <laughs> like, I know Margot's is still alive, obviously. But yeah. I thought that maybe they thought she was dead dead. And it turns out that like they knew that the ambulance crashed and that Margot's body was never found. I don't know what's in the water in Sweet Valley, but maybe <laughs> put actual water and less salad dressing in there. Yes, I agree. And can we talk about how, again, there are four of them that look identical. I'm sticking with my underground government. <laughs> <laughs> conspiracy to breed an ultimate weapon. Yeah, I think that's totally fair. Um, I would not be surprised if that's this actually This would also happening. explain why the parents have so little emotional investment in their children. Oh, yeah, it would. You're right. Good call. Yeah, because they're just, you know, some government patsies who are like, well, the program's been canceled. We have to dump these kids somewhere. So you're taking over raising these children and- It's like the Truman Show. Yeah, kind of. Or <laughs> um, you ever see Clone High? Uh, no. Anyway, point is, clones get stuck with human foster parents. Yeah. That's basically what it is. That's so, that's what we learned. They're really just clones being stuck with human foster parents. Clones from a program to breed the perfect killing machine. Or <laughs> psychics. It was a psychic breeding program, maybe. And yeah, I think it's just a supernatural in general breed, like mental supernatural athletics. Right, because she did mention her powers are greatest at night. Exactly. And it would explain why Elizabeth and Jessica constantly have psychic dreams. All right. And well, psychic twin I knowledge. think we've cracked the case. Sweet Valley <laughs> is a government <laughs> test site where they release all the failed experiments from their underground cloning program for making the psychic super soldiers. That would explain a lot of these books. <laughs> yeah, and why no one seems to care when everyone dies, because they've all had their empathy bred out of them so they can be the perfect killing machine. Excellent. Well, I'm glad we figured that out. All right. Shoot Valley High. <laughs> Solved. What's the next series? Let's do it. <laughs> Next up, the Hardy Boys. Let's figure those guys out. <laughs> I'm down. Let's do that. <laughs> so here for the Hardy Boys. If you out there have a theory for why Sweet Valley High is the way it is, please write us. Let us know. You can reach us at bookretorts.com. You can also reach us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We would love to hear more. If you have more theories about Sam's clone idea, we would love to hear like a further elaboration of that. Or your own alternate theory. I'm, I'm good for either. Yeah, that would be cool too. There's probably some fan fiction out there with some Sweet Valley High. I, I'm sure there is. Theory, I'm not sure I want fiction. to read it, though. <laughs> That probably exists. Feel free to shoot us a link if there's some cloning action going on about the evil twins. Uh, just make sure it's not anything too objectionable. <laughs> I said clone theory. I was trying to be specific. Yeah, but who knows what else is in there too, Danielle? <laughs> That's true. All right. Well, I guess until next week, when our next weird thing is hopefully <laughs> this insane, because I don't know how we're going to top that. It's impossible. But please, <laughs> drop by and find out next week. And until then, bye. Take care, everybody.
that was weird, man. That was weird. I know. It's super weird. Such a, <laughs> like, I was reading it. I was like, how did this book get weirder than the last one? <laughs> I'm genuinely impressed. Well done. Well done for being weirder than your previous book somehow. 